Uh, you, Alan's been teaching us about uh, salt and light, and he said a few weeks ago how the salt they're talking about could be fertilizer, and he reminded us that if you've ever fertilized your lawn, and if you tipped your uh, uh, sprayer out and the fertilizer landed in one place, it kills all the grass in that place. And so too much light and fertilizer in the same place is blinding and toxic. That's why, although it's good to have church, church is really a, an equipping station so that we could broadcast the light and the fertilizer and not have it here because it tends to be kind of toxic and dangerous if it's all about us. And then Steve's been teaching us about healing, this being a healing center. And more than that, he's been, we're talking about healing of body, soul, and spirit. And he's been making a pretty excellent case that Christian, much of Christianity has evolved to where it's, a, it's about argument and opinion and it no longer is about power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And truly, if, if you get opportunity, and we may grant this opportunity to do some work in the mission field and developing nations, you'll see some of that first century stuff with healings, people raised from the dead and everything that's going on around there, and we're just not quite seeing as much here, but may, we may yet. Uh, some of you may have gotten this prayer list. Um, frequently, I'm abraded by those who, remind, who are upset that we're not informing you of all the missions we support and all the stuff we're doing. Well, this week and the weeks to come will be the opportunity. But here's a list of uh, actually a total of 14 missions that we support. So every time you give a dollar to New Life, 15 of the cents will go towards these works, and you're actually investing in them, and you're getting a little bit of fruit of the work that they're doing around the world. And so this is an opportunity to pray for them at least in addition to support them, and we'll go into that in more detail. I, I entitled this Outward Bound. There's an organization called Outward Bound. Is anybody aware of it or anybody ever been on an Outward Bound trip? I don't know if there's, there have been. Basically, it's for young people or medium-aged people in which you're challenged, you, you're physically and mentally challenged to go to places that are kind of dangerous and crazy. And so I was thinking that, you know, I, and I, I've always been signed up for that. That's never been a problem. More challenging is to be able to be outward bound for God and the gospel, which is every bit as dangerous and every bit as more uh, in, in th adventuresome, but so the theme of this will be to always become more outward bound. Now, here's, uh, here's one of the things they did where they would go up and have, like Eskimos, and be with dog sleds and everything at outward bound. Here's, there they are with their dog and uh, their base. Here's their camp. You can imagine how cold it is, et cetera. Breakfast or lunch, whatever that is that they're pouring there. Here's a trip into the woods in some whitewater rafting. Now, as I prepared this, the person I thought of is our pastor, Steve. Because I, if you know Steve, you realize that his idea of a good time is waking up in a tent at 30 below zero and drinking three-day-old instant coffee, if you know our pastor. Um, not quite, actually. but uh, Now, believe it or not, in my younger days, I was completely signed up for that. And I've been on some really cool adventures, not with Outward Bound, but it's never been a problem for me to be, put myself in physical danger. Now, the spiritual danger worries me a little bit more. Does anybody know what this is? Rocky Face. Has anybody hiked Rocky Face? Yeah, we got some adventures. Has anybody climbed the face? Oh, there you go. We got some repellers and everything. Quite cool. You know, the, I was the director of the paramedics, the EMS in the county for 12 years, and they, they repel off that, and they learn how to do rescue there. Look at this. Aaron. You can't start too early. That little boy climbing the face there. Does anybody know what mountain this is? That's Grandfather Mountain. I don't know if you know this. This is a view from the north, like Banner Elk, Beach Mountain. You'll see it's, it's supposed to be the face of a guy. He's like laying down. That's his head. So a little bit on this side is his forehead. You go down to his brow, his, uh, his mouth, and then his chin. And there's a place, I think it's, is it, not 105, it's the road that heads up to Beach Mountain. You get this view of it. And I've hiked this many times. In fact, back at the church that existed before New Life, we would have youth groups, we'd go up there, and there's a wonderful hike from the parkway. It takes about eight hours going across all the peaks, and it was really fun. Here's the view from the top. It's really, really cool, Grandfather Mountain. Now, 
to brag a little bit, in 1918, my, no, 18, 1981, uh, my wife and I were, lived in Kenya for a summer at, at an elevation of 7,000 feet. At 7,000 feet in the mountains, there's no insects. There wasn't mosquitoes or anything. And it was cool in the morning. It got hot in the day. It rained every day at 2 o'clock, cooled everything down. There was baboons and monkeys around. It was like paradise. And we were there for two or three months. And then uh, I got a chance to, this is Mount Kenya, a 17,000-foot peak, and I climbed this mountain, a three-day expedition. On the top of that mountain, it, the oxygen, percentage of oxygen in your blood is 80%. Now, some of us, unfortunately, recently, some of our body have had COVID, and if there's this test where they put this thing on your finger and it checks your oxygen, it's supposed to be 100%, 95 and above, no problem. But if you have pneumonia problems, it drops lower, so you have to be on oxygen. And if you get in the 80s, you have to be on oxygen. Uh, well, actually, on the peak of Kenya, it's 80%. I had a headache. I got mountain sickness. If I knew what I knew now, I probably wouldn't even attempt it. In fact, Mount uh, Everest, the oxygen concentration is so low, it approaches that amount in your veins. So if you took a person and put them on Everest with a, just dropped them up there, uh, it was like putting a bag on his head. And in the old days, about one in 12 people died in the climb, and about 67% came down with some disability after the climb. It's just a plum bad idea. But uh, somehow I did it, and it was kind of cool, and it, it was kind of fun. Climb in Kenya. The motto of Outward Bound, they have two of them. One is to serve, to strive, and not yield. And the one I like, if you can't get out of it, get into it. So that's a great saying if you're in a problem or circumstance. Alan was teaching about that today, how you can attack these things head on. I hope that in new life we become more outward bound. Now, although I'll be talking about missionaries, missions, et cetera, et cetera, we are all missionaries. And, and some of you had a, there's three missions. There's local missions, Alexander County, family, friends. There's national missions, and there's international missions. And some of you had a call on your life for missions, and you knew it. That call's still there. You just have not been commissioned. And often there's a, there's a time between the call and the commissioning. David was a little boy when he was anointed by Samuel, and he didn't become a king for like 40 years later. There's the call and the commission. And if some of you have been through a rough life and the devil has thrown everything but the kitchen sink at you and you've got cashed in your chips with this possibility, it's always possible to get that commissioning. And so hear what I'm saying. I'll try to run through this quickly. What is the mission of the church? The mission of the church, the main mission, is to glorify and worship God and give thanks. The most famous question to, if you're raised a Presbyterian, if you were raised as a Presbyterian kid, you had to answer this question. What, was, what is the chief end of man? And it is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is the Westminster Confession of Faith for the Presbyterians here. Number one, to glorify God. Number two, to preach and teach the word of God. Second Tim, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Number three, to train, build up, and nurture the saints. And it was given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the building up of the body. Four, Alan has been teaching on this, and Steve, to represent the interest of the kingdom of God in the world and to influence our society with the ideas, the truth of the word, and the truth of the Lord. And uh, we got had this earlier that we are the salt, we are the light of the world, and we are responsible for affecting the world around us. And as Alan and Steve always teach, our goal is to bless our community and not curse our community. And Jeremiah the admonition to the, the Jewish people that had been sent into, into captivity in Babylon, these cruel enemies of theirs that had destroyed their temple, destroyed their place, they were to seek the welfare of the city, which would have been Babylon. In our case, it's the nation, the world, where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. So we are to be a blessing to the place around us. And number five, to make disciples and evangelize the world. Jesus his last admonition before uh, he rose to his father was, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now, our personal gifting, passions, and concerns will lead us to value certain areas of ministry. In leadership here, I mean, as a church, you're about one of the least complaining churches I've, I'm aware of. You're a good crowd. But sometimes people will say, you know, why aren't we doing more evangelism? Or why, are, why is there so much worship? Or why is there so much word? And usually that is you have a, a gifting in a different in worship or in evangelism. And so it, that's, that's the eyes you see through. It's, it baffles you that everybody is an evangelist. Why are we? So, and so the point is, sometimes it's just because as God has made us different, there's, there's a whole thing that the church needs to be doing, that we have to be involved with, but sometimes certain churches emphasize other, other, certain things and other things, and if you're not in that emphasis, you'll sometimes kind of be down on the church, but you need to bear with us. Um, because there's a risk you'll end up judging church as being inadequate when you're just seeing it from your gift, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, now at New Life, clearly we have four emphases. Worship, word, prophecy, and healing. And if you listen to Alan at all, prophecy in this church is not future telling. Prophecy is how we experience God in the moment by sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, being able to hear the still small voice of the Spirit. And then that makes us a prophetic people like the Old Testament, where sometimes some people would occasionally hear from God and speak it. We have that opportunity all the time because the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh by the Joel prophecy and the preaching of, of Peter, Peter at Pentecost, point being that prophecy is about experiencing God. And then finally, healing, that it has been prophesied that we'll be at a healing center, we've experienced it to some degree, and we will more. more. That is our emphasis. Um, on prophecy, the apostle writes, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. And so for churches that are nervous about prophecy are just not seeing the word, explaining that things that sometimes are a little bit difficult, you work through and you learn them. Because Paul and Jesus and God want us prophesied. With respect to healing, 1 Peter, he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. A promise now, future, and past. In uh, in 3 John, beloved, I pray that you all may go well with you, that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So it is God's will that, that his word is preached, worship occurs, there's prophecy, and we pray for healing. What is the weakness of new life? Our weakness has always been outreach and evangelism. Now, why is that? The main reason, unfortunately, is that usually the, the emphasis of the church is set by the leadership. And in you, you got some decent, fairly good leaders here, myself included. Uh, but none of us are really evangelists. And so you don't have, since we don't have evangelists in the leadership, we run the risk of not majoring on that or not trying to bring it to the forefront. But some of you are evangelists, all of you are missionaries, and we are willing to say yes to this because we know that is a big part of what the church is up to. Uh, Jesus said in Acts, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea to the ends of the earth. Now, the promise, we want the power of the Holy Spirit here. The main promise of the need for the power of the Holy Spirit is to make us witnesses. And so not only would it behoove us to be witnesses to extend the gospel to the world, but it is very likely we will see more power of God if we are witnesses. God loves healing, he loves prophecy, he loves word, but truly the Savior as he left said, I gave you power to be witnesses. Signs and wonders tend to follow where individual Christians and churches are faithful witnesses. We truly, all Christians, myself included, we need to be more outward bound, dedicated to outreach, this will not change what we're doing in new life, our emphasis or direction, but it may push us to step up as our role as witnesses in the community. Advantages, salvations, opportunity to disciple, church growth. The advantage of church growth is you have more resources, more things to do. As you meet the missionaries I teach you about, you will want to support them. You will want to figure out a way. How can we get more money into the work that these people are doing? 
we will have, if we are witnesses, if we're faithful, we will have more authority in our worship, our word, our healing emphasis. There will be actual manifesting authority versus theoretical authority. There's a lot of talk in the church. There's even a lot of talk here. But it's one thing to talk, and it's one thing that things really happen. It has dawned on me that the reason that all Christians have been so bent out of shape this last year about arguments in media is we have fallen into a deception that the world gets won by argument. And if it is my opinions versus Satan and evil, I'm going to lose all the time. Unlike the Charlie Daniels songs where the guy gets into a fiddle match with the devil and wins, you don't win a fiddle match with the devil. I mean, the only hope is the Word of God, the power behind it, but demonstrated with power. Indeed, if you look at history, the first 300 years of Christianity, the Christians had no voice in the public square. They couldn't stand up and say anything like the Internet. They'd be put in jail. Christianity took over the Roman Empire without persuasion. They did it by love, showing kindness on a grassroots level, by exorcisms and by healings. Truly, it was power encounters that won the Roman Empire. What happened then, once we got in a position where we could talk and speak, it's been kind of downhill from there for 1,700 years. And we need to recover our witness and the power. And once we demonstrate a degree of it, our witness has more power before God as a legitimate, but before the angels, the devils, and our community. David Livingstone, the famous African missionary, said, the best remedy for a sick church is to be put on a missionary diet. My authority, all authority has been given me, I send you. Ah, the picture's not coming up, but um, Michelle, if you'd go to the next slides. I have some great pictures, so many that this is a huge file, so you're going to have to bear with me here. Now, I'm going to introduce you. We have, like I said, we support all kinds of missionaries. They're just wonderful. But the one I'm going to introduce you to, there's a couple by the name of Charlie and Kathy Milbrook. And they, what happened was, it, Charlie Milbrook was a biker, drugs and everything, and he just got miraculously born again. This would have been the mid-'80s. And God told him, you need to go to Thailand. And when he tells his story, he didn't even know where Thailand was, you know. And it turns out, of course, to be about as far away in the world as, as anything possible. And so he went, there was this ministry school in Tulsa, kind of famous on the TV and everything. And he started pestering them to death saying, listen, I know I love my biker. I just got born again, but I'm supposed to go to Thailand. And they kept on trying to put him off, but he just pestered them enough that they let him in their school. He met his wife, Kathy, uh, and then he put together this plan to go to Thailand. Where we have to do with him is that in the probably late 80s, early 90s, he came to this region and he went through the phone book to raise support. And he called every church he could see in the phone book. And he called uh, uh, Living Faith, the church before us, the pastor before, Rudy Hollingsworth, and said, can I come talk to you guys? And he said, sure. And so we got, we got to know uh, him and Kathy. Now, when he tells the story... So he got together, not enough support. He goes over to Thailand. He plants himself in the jungle with his wife and two kids. And uh, they didn't know who to talk to, what to do. They got to the point where they had run out of food. And what happens when he tells the story is that uh, he, first of all, there were these two babies that were, go- were going to die. And uh, in developing nations, uh, some countries, twins, they're superstitious about twins, and they let one die. They think it's bad luck. When we're, Lynn and I were in Kenya, we were rescuing twins all the time. Some countries, like Africa, value the women better and don't care if the little boys die. Some places, like India, value the men more and not the women. In fact, they, one time they did an audit of an abortion clinic in India, and out of 3,000 abortions, 2,999 were little girls. That was interesting because the feminists were a little worried about that because, you know, I guess it's kind of a problem if they abort all the women on earth. That'd, defeat our purpose somewhat. Uh, but uh, anyway, so these two, they, they took these two babies in, and eventually this became an orphanage that now feeds 700 people per day, and I'll show you pictures of it. But in addition to that, he tells a story about these jungle boys. He said that they didn't know what to do, but they met these two boys, that he, and he calls them affectionately jungle boys. It's kind of like, you know, the, like uh, uh, Mowgli and 
uh, the Jungle Book. That is, couldn't read or write. There were these little, like, wild little monkeys, like feral children. And, and, so, and so he brought them in and started teaching them about the Bible and everything. And he was, they were the only two people in the school. They didn't have food or anything. But he sent them out to this village. And they went to this village. And, of course, they just believed whatever Charlie told them, whatever the Bible said. They had no filter. And there was a lady, a prominent lady in the village who well, they really respected and loved, but she was bedfast and couldn't get up. Well, they prayed over her, and she started walking. And she told everybody in the village, and the whole village wanted this, and the whole village got saved. And that was the beginning of this whole thing. So they were down to the last chance, and God did this. Anyway, they have since graduated hundreds of Bible college students. The Milroads and their graduates have planted churches in virtually every region of Thailand. They sponsor church building, and for $5,000 U.S., they build the church. Now, when I said they, they probably have thousands of Bible studies and churches, but I'll, they have actually built 220 churches. New Life, on two occasions before, we've actually purchased one of those. We have a mission committee tomorrow. Mission committee meeting tomorrow. Pray for me. I want to make a case that we build another church for just $5,000, nothing to it. They average 15 to 18 churches built per year, and six churches are under construction right now. Now, I've said this before, and anybody looks at me like I'm a heretic, but Charlie Milbrode, when, when Paul was going through the Mediterranean, you, there probably is about a dozen or 18 churches he planted, and probably few of them were as big as New Life. This guy has done more in his life than the Apostle Paul did. Now, Grant Apostle Paul wrote the Bible. You know, he's, he, he'll be in good shape in heaven. I'm not demeaning. He's my, he and David are my two, guys, two main guys, main guys in the Bible. But this is a serious guy. Involved in community development. They have coffee plantations and distribution, sustainable farming, occupational training. He says when he first got there, the place was just terrible. He said that people lived in shacks and they were worshiping all these demons. And the demons through their witch doctors would tell them they had to move their hut 10 feet over. So they disassemble the whole thing out of superstition and move it 10 feet over. And he said the trick of the devil, of course, you couldn't develop because you wouldn't build anything if you had to rebuild it every time it turned around. So, but he has so transformed that area that when people go visit him and he describes it in the early days, they think he's lying because now the place is developed and it's a decent place because of their work. They work at the Thai-Myanmar border. There's a lot of the news about Myanmar. There's all kinds of war and stuff going on. Well, there's some ethnic groups that have been driven out, and, the, and they're refugees in Thailand. They recently supplied 170 tons of rice, which is 4 million meals. They supply medicine, water purification systems, tarps for shelters, and mosquito nets. Is what this, this guy, this biker, who was told he needed to go to Thailand. Here's where Thailand is. This is one of the churches. 220 of these have built. A little congregation. This is their graduation of their Bible school. This is an evangelistic team. Now, I don't know if you know, but Andy Elliott has said, if you could send out a team like this, he would donate some of the guitars. Maybe we'd pick up the tab there, and you could go out and go to Walmart and play your guitars or whatever the heck those guys are doing. Charlie is, uh, he's kind of in the middle, in the shadow there. There they're doing clinics. And he sent me this one picture. Here's a typical trip, you know, in the jungle. Those of us who have been to Guatemala know what this is like as well. This is their latest dorm they built for the orphanage. We've been funding that for, partially from New Life for years. All the children with Kathy. And a little girl. Isn't that sweet? So, and so this, it, it is possible to make incredible impact. Faith in God versus the faith of God. Steve's been teaching us. There, it's like what we attempt to do, we have, we have to do it with power. It has to be the Holy Spirit. There is a high risk of church being a form of godliness but denying its power. People in this community think new life is weird. We are not nearly weird enough. I mean, I mean Christianity is about people popping up and testifying, repenting, power in the room, raising people from the dead. That is normal Christianity. We are still on the mild end of the spectrum here. Now, our efforts to become more outward bound will reap benefits not only of salvation, growing the kingdom, but our worship, our preaching, our prayers for healing will have more authority. 
as God, our human community around us, and the satanic realm realize that we are walking in authority and this isn't a bunch of talk. But that includes the willingness to spread our faith. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. I, I had a slide and I took it out, but I made me think of it. If you're, if you're in astronomy, there are these little tiny stars it's called fifth or sixth magnitude you can't see. And the way you see it is you look a little bit away from it. It's crazy. You can't look right at it. You look right by it, and in part of your, uh, your periphery of your vision, you'll see it. The reason I say that, if as a church or even as a person, we want power, you can't look at it. It's like it's signs following. It's like power always corrupts. You have to be obedient to the Savior with holy lives, with our main purpose, which was the, what was given to us as witnesses, the power, and then the power will truly come. Uh, as Christians, we need to remember that it is not just what we're saved from, sin, death, and hell, but what we are saved for to bring the good news to others. We have been saved in order to bless others by offering them salvation, comfort, support, and love. Our goal should be to become physically, psychologically, spiritually healthy enough to be in the front lines again and serve in the army of God and not spend our whole lives in the hospital of God. We are all missionaries to our small realm of influence, your family, your children, your neighbors. If we have the Holy Spirit, we have the responsibility to be good and effective witnesses in the way we act and what we say. Charles Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Here is his church in England, picture of it. Carl Barth, uh, most of you aren't theologians here, but in the late 1800s, early 1900s, pretty much the theology of the church was taken over by higher criticism, the much, much of German uh, theor, theologian in which uh, Jesus was mythology, just history, and the only holdouts were the fundamentalists, some of our buddies in the independent churches there, but the, the whole world had gone after liberal thinking. Karl Barth was what was called neo-orthodox. He was an academic, pretty smart dude, but he stood up for saying, no, guys, and he stood with the fundamentalists who were just seen as crazy wild people. He was some of the academics and a few others, Matthew Henry, there's a bunch of them that kind of formed evangelicalism that stood up, and, uh, and eventually there was a comeback. Anyway, for the, being a church for the sake of the world. Now, there was another fellow in the 1800s named uh, Frederick Nietzsche. He's the one everybody always quotes saying, that which does not, make you, that which does not kill you make you stronger. Of course, you're, you're uh, quoting an inveterate atheist. But um, uh, Nietzsche claimed, wrote, God is dead, he remains dead, and we have killed him. Now, in the context, fairless to him, he isn't saying, he's saying that humans, by the reliance on technology, reason, academia, enlightenment, had killed God, the need for God is what he was saying. So Nietzsche wasn't even being an atheist. He was saying, you guys have killed, killed him. He ain't around hardly anymore. And he predicted the decline of religious beliefs by the late 1800s. In fact, this, is, this was 1966, before the charismatic movement got big, before the Jesus movement, before, and there was, a, there was a cover of Time magazine, Is God Dead? Now I can tell you that God is not dead. In fact, he's back. This is a picture you see before. This is one of Reinhard Bonnke's crusades in Africa, 1.5 million people at it. Now, we have a, a friend of our ministry, and Steve is Robert Mairns, who is uh, Irish, knows Reinhard Bonnke and has been to his church. And he says his church has 200, 250 people. His church is the size of new life, almost. And he goes to Africa, and 1.5 million people Come to his crusades. It's like, I mean, they have thousands of people to minister to the people that come forward. Uh, quickly, Christianity is doing relatively well. We could do better, but there's more Christians or confessing Christians than any other religions. Uh, we're growing at about 1.27%. 
10% per year. Bear with me here. This is, I love this type of statistic stuff. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, Islam, the Sikhs, and the Hindus are outgrowing us a little bit. Now, some of this isn't fair because you can either be born into a religion or you could be born again into a religion. You know what I'm saying? So if you have rules that you can't use birth control and stuff, you'll have more people born into your religion even though they're not born again. You know what I'm saying? So the fact that we're a little bit responsible with our child having is kind of unfair in the statistics, but uh, it's cooler that people are born again than just born into the church too. But we're still doing pretty well here. Uh, we still outnumber about everybody else. You look at this map. Okay, purple, blue uh, is and pinkish or Christian forms of Christianity, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant. The green is Islam. Uh, the orange, it is Hindu. And then the uh, Buddhism is in China. So there's a swath there. That's called the 1040 window. And if you're into missions, we've been praying for decades for the 1040 window that goes from 10 degrees, uh, uh, it goes from 40 degrees uh, latitude north to about 10 degrees latitude south, I think. Could be wrong. But it's a strip like this that you see all the unreached people of the world. Now, Pentecostal and Charismatics and Evangelicals are increasing the facets of all Christian groups. Most mainline denominations, Catholicism and Orthodox is declining. It's our goofy crowd that's growing a little bit. There are churches in Latin America and Africa that have over 100,000 members that are growing so fast. In South Korea in the 1900s, there were virtually no Christians. Today, over 30% of the population is evangelical. A few years ago, Alan brought a bunch of Koreans to this church, and those guys are crazy for God. They pray all the time. They pray 24-7. You know, uh, it's just amazing how excited they are for the Lord, and that's from nothing. In China in the 1950s, the number of Christians was in the 100,000s. Right now, they estimate 120 million believers in home churches. It's calculated that between 150 and 200,000 people become Christians every day. So maybe you're not that impressed with how we're doing around here, but Christianity is doing fine. It's growing. We are going to make it. Now, there's, uh, in addition to supporting the missions, you know, if, make sure you get a copy of this. If we, I think we've run out. We'll have some more next week, so you can pray for the various people. This, some of these people are not even on the list because we just we support them not every month. But the fellow there on the left is uh, named Pastor Abel. He's a pastor in Havana, Cuba. And who's behind him? That's Michael Fox. That's Mike there checking his iPhone, maybe seeing if Selena was trying to call him in Cuba. The first couple of days, he didn't do this AT&T thing. So the calls, he had like a $500 AT&T bill within two or three days, which we worked through. But anyway, now Pastor Abel is a Cuban pastor. Um, my, I, I, I'm on three mission boards. One of the mission boards is Helping Hands, which has been doing part, uh, missions to Cuba since the, 18, the 1980s. Anyway, so this fella, his, dad, his uncle was a Baptist pastor, and he was supposed to be the heir apparent. But he and his wife wanted to start a ministry among drug addicts and prostitutes at a part of Havana called the Malcon. It's in the news right now. That's where all the, the riots are going on. And so he set up a, a little a, a storefront with he and his wife only, and eventually it grew to a church of 400 people. And it was supported by uh, our, our ministry. Anyway, he is the funnest guy, complete goof. Most of these missionaries that you'll meet are self-effacing, funny comedians. They are not religious at all. You'd never guess they're missionaries. Well, he is the, he's the funniest guy. Anyway, he, so this is property that he has, and we're helping him try to build a church there. There you see Larry Boyer and uh, Mike. It's a posed picture, you know. They really didn't do any work with shovels. I just said it all like that. <laughs> now, they actually, you know, worked a lot in this, you know, 110-degree Cuban heat. There's Linda, my dear wife, by this block wall. Okay, now, this looks like you're at Scotty's on last Saturday, but what this is, is in Cuba, we put an embargo, so they, t until recently, they had no cars there. All their cars were before 1959, all of them. They just kept fixing them, putting new engines in them. Now, so most of them are just these junkers, but the guys that are taxi drivers, that, that when the tourists come, they fix up their cars. And so you, everywhere you go, that there's like a site. To, it, it looks like Scotty's during the vintage car show because these are all the taxi cabs that these guys have fixed up. And I was down there with uh, Dean Simpson, who's a car buff, and he was naming off all these 1930s Oldsmobiles and stuff. It was really quite cool. Now, our pastor, he had a, a 19... 50s 
Buick station wagon with a dot, uh, Datsun engine in it, and there, the, you know, the panels in the front, there were all just holes there. You know, he had no instruments. And so the way he would tell, uh, when he was running out of gas, he had to use a dipstick occasionally. And so we were going somewhere. Of course, in all these countries, they drive like maniacs, you know. You, when I was in Iraq, they drive, you drive as fast as the car will go until there's a turn. They don't even look at their things anyway. Yeah, I mean, I was in Iraq, and we were paying 160 kilometers an hour, which is 100 miles an hour. Anyway, so, so anyway, so we said to, this one person said to Pastor Abel, how do you know how fast you're going? And he says, he goes, well, when the police pull me over, I say, officer, how fast was I going? <laughs> and so we started laughing, and the other people in the car who had been down, they go, no, this has really happened. This has really has happened. Well, anyway, okay, so... We were told he had a church of 400 people. Now, I've been in missions, and I've been in Christianity for, for 40 years, and people tend to exaggerate. And so a lot of times you're hoping, okay, 150, 200, you know, 400, I doubt it. Well, anyway, so we go to this place in town. It's like a storefront, and you couldn't see behind it. So it looked like downtown's Taylorsville, like where you're, in, you know, I buy the, the floral shop or something. That's what it looked like. And we walked in it, and there were these people sitting there. And, I, of course, I thought that was a church, you know, 40 or 50 people. And I go, here you go, 400 people, whatever. There was 50 people in this room. Well, then we kept walking, and here was the church. That was the new believers class, the people that had gotten saved in the last week or two. That was what we walked through. And then here's the church. Now, you'll see Linda's there, Mike. And if you've ever been in developing nations or places in revival, you walk in, and your knees almost buckle. It's like there's so much presence you can't stand. And that's the way it was. And the worship, everything was just wonderful. This is the people that got saved during the service. That would be added to that other room. <laughs> anyway, now, this is the way they did their life groups. They would go out in the square, and they would worship. And, of course, people would come up, and they'd talk to them, and they'd talk to them about the Lord, and they'd let them sing too. And so it was, it was really happening. And it was a wonderful experience. It was, an, it was, it was an, I know it's a communist country, but they treated us like kings. We were taken care of. It's, a, you know, it's like a two-hour drive from, a fly, fly from here. It's easier to go to visit these guys than it is to go to California. And maybe it's a safer place in California, too, actually. Um, but right, so we're, we're trying to get back down there. Right now, there's riots, there's problems. COVID shut the whole place down. But uh, uh, Mike Fox and I keep in touch with Pastor Abel, and eventually we'll go down there, honestly. Don't be intimidated. You want a great trip? We, get, we stay at a, a Methodist dorm there. Uh, they feed us. They take care of you. Um, it's a wonderful trip. Okay. Now, Christianity in Europe and the United States has recently been described as, by Christian growth experts as Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and dem democratic, which spells weird. Now, it is not weird because it's goofy, spooky, or strange it's actually pretty tame, sophisticated, and relatively accepted by its culture. Now, although I know every once in a while people call us names on the Internet, that's not real persecution. Western Christianity is a religion of ideas, opinions, and arguments that tries to win convert, converts with persuasion, but not by the demonstration of power. It may have the power to say, but it is powerless to heal and deliver from demons. In contrast, Christianity in Latin America, Africa, and Asia reaches the poor in autocratic governments. It's Pentecostal charismatic with an emphasis on personal encounters and the gifts of the Spirit, recognizes the demonic and the need for healing of body, soul, and spirit, features supernatural healing and exorcism, is a religion of power, not just argument. This is the new normal. Now, I say new compared to 1,700 years of history. This is the original right. Christianity. And the reason we're weird is because we have taken a side road to argument, discussion, and philosophy away from the original power and the power that's available. Apostle Paul, I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with elo eloquence or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ and him crucified. My message and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith would not rest on wisdom, but on God's power. Now, we're not talking Peter and Jesus here. We're talking 
Paul, you know, your theology, this is the guy that set the pattern for the church, and he relied on power. Developing nation Christianity, lacking the resources of the West, depends on the Holy Spirit and power. Kingdom demonstrated, not just talked about. A philosophy of, if for you Latin fans, contra factum known as argumentum, which means against the fact there can be no argument. When I give my testimony, I cannot be talked out of a God. It doesn't matter. If you encounter him, you, you're ruined. Okay, the percentage of unevangelized is shrinking. At uh, 100 years ago, only half the population of the world had heard. As of, what, 10 years ago, it's up to about only a quarter has not heard. There's still slightly more than 2 billion people living today of the 8 billion that are considered unevangelized. Bear with me. There's 250 countries. There's 24,000 people groups, of which 16,000 have been reached by the gospel. 7,300 major language groups in the world. A full Bible is available in 700, or a tenth of those, full Bible, which gives about 5 billion people access. The New Testament is available in another 1,500 languages. And sections and stories are available in a further 1,100, spoken by this amount. So at present, of those uh, 7,000 language groups, there's total or part of scriptures available in a little more than half, And that number was a third of that when I was born again. So because of all the works of missions and word processors particularly, we've made, I mean, 2,000 years, we're waiting for Jesus to come back, which will not happen until every tribe, tongue, and nation have heard. And it's been in the last generation that we've got all this work done. Total groups, listen to this. With or soon to have part of the scripture within 10 years is 6,000 out of the 73,000. It's 100. Okay, so we're close. And trust me, I'm going to go through a few things quickly. What has to occur before Jesus returns? Events that have recurred in part. One is calamities, earthquakes, natural disasters, plagues, wars, famines, false prophets and deceptions. The internet is hotbed of this right now that everybody can see and hear. You know, you know in Revelations, how everybody's going to see the Antichrist. I mean, just open up your phone, you know, we're so close. Um, the love of many will grow cold. Persecution of believers. With all the work that's being done in the world and all the persecution coming against Christians by Muslims and Hindu extremists, etc., there are more people martyred per year in the faith than any time in history. So, these things have occurred. What has to yet occur? The gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth, Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Revelations, worthy are you to take the scroll, open its seals. You were slain, and by your blood you purchased for God those of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom of priests, and they will reign on the earth. You know, I mean, when you read Paul, they thought Jesus was coming back, but the poor guys, they didn't even know that Bornea existed. You know, it's like there was a little microcosm there. And they, we are now close to when he could come back, and never before. Okay, now events that still have to occur, the abomination of desolations, the maturing of the church, uh, it's an interesting point. I mean, do we, is that, is Jesus waiting on that? Or is he just gonna come back? There's a place where Jesus says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? So the poor, even Jesus is wondering, what am I gonna get when I come back? And so, but the hope would be that there's some maturing of the church. Number two, the national repentance of Israel, Zechariah 14, the reference. And then number three, the one body of church in Messianic Israel is yet to occur. But this could be closer than we think. The Great Tribulation, the gathering of the church. Okay, mission experts say between 2026 and 2031, it could be that we have a little bit of the Bible in every, every language. Quite interestingly, 2033 is 3,000 years from the death of Jesus, and 2040 is the year the Hebrew calendar ends. So am I making a case that we could be closer? I mean, you know, we've wanted this all these years, but the data is coming in that the end is near, like the, the flea said on the end of the dog. Okay, 
Now, I think I'm going to just do a little bit more. If you go ahead and uh, I'll go about another five minutes or so. And then uh, I'll be doing this through the summer the, we'll, the, as the Spirit leads because I'm going to yet get into famous missionaries and I'm going to yet get into our famous missionaries, some of which are sitting here in our congregation today, and then continue to exhort you to the possibility that you could become a missionary. Let's talk about David Livingstone a little bit. He's this famous guy of the phrase, Dr. Livingstone, I, I presume. He was the first white explorer in the heart of Africa in the mid-1800s. Now, uh, Africa, of course, is right below Europe, and North Africa, the sides of, Europe, of Africa have been known for thousands of years. But Africa, the heart of Africa, was so dangerous with disease and the wild tribes that Europeans didn't, I mean, for the thousands of years of Western civilization, nobody fooled with them. And so, except for these two dudes I won't go into, Livingstone was the first guy that actually went into the center of Africa. He was a Scottish missionary. Listen to what he said about Africa. Africa was a region of uttermost dread, where serpent rocks and ogre islands lie in wait for the mariner, where the great hand of Satan reaches up from the fathomless depths to seize him. So they were scared of this place. But Livingstone was more than willing to go into the center of the Africa of the first white. He earned the respect of the Africans. He had respected them. He worked to end the East African slave trade. He was greatly feared by the African slave traders. He would go after them with whips and just cuss them and just go crazy. He we couldn't take it. He spent the last six years out of contact with the outside world, four of them violently ill with physical problems. And then in, seven, in 1871, he was found by the American reporter Henry Stanley two years before his death. He died at age 60. Here's a picture of his, he's probably sitting there in the front with that younger person uh, with his train of folks going to uh, research uh, places in Africa. He was attacked by a lion that chewed one of his arms and he had a crippled arm from being bitten by a lion that he was trying to shoot. So he was no wimp. He was a pretty cool guy. This is a picture of Africa. Up top, you'll see desert. Down below, you see jungle. But this was a map of Africa in 1813. You see the lower half, there's no roads. No one had ever been in there. And this intrepid guy decided, I'm going to go into Africa. Of course, uh, Lynn and I spent time there. And I mean, Africa, beautiful place, kind of wild and crazy, but it's wonderful. This was his trips there. And I'm going to stop there. When we get started again, I'm going to talk about some of the other missionaries we support. This, this uh, pair, uh, Tim and Doris, are really... Uh, yeah, about as intrepid as, uh, um, as uh, Livingstone was, and we'll tell his story. Uh, in preview, New Life sent teams down to work with this couple from 1990, not, 1995 to 2012. We sent about 20 trips, and we helped them build a hospital from ground up that's still existing today. We have adopted a village in which we helped that village be able to get rainwater catchment, um, sand filters, uh, helped them build a school, and so all these were things we did over the years, and many of these people you're still supporting, and these are still opportunities in the future. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunities we have. I pray, Lord, that you would spark the fire in us again um, of uh, being willing to be outward and uh, being willing to be witnesses to our family. I pray that, uh, like Alan is teaching us, that we become, become salt and light. We don't imitate it. That is... It's easy to witness just as we have the joy and the peace in us and just as we're enthusiastic about other things, we're enthusiastic about you in which we can invite people to the faith, invite people to church. And I pray you also would be with uh, those that know they had a calling and missed it, that they would yet say yes to the call in your li their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, there are opportunities. I finished right on time. As Alan said before, a lot goes on after the service. And so you're free to go. But what I'm going to suggest today, you know, most of the time an altar call is, you know, you sinners come forward and confess your sins. I mean, today it's going to be more like a commissioning. That is, if you had hopes that maybe you could go into mission sometime, if you knew you were supposed to and have given up on it, if there, you have a sense there's a call on your life, uh, I would love you all to come forward. And there's a bunch of opportunities for you. That is, you can come to the altar just between you and God, and you can say, God, is there still something you want me to do? Someplace you want me to go? Ask for his power to help you. So between you and God here. 
Uh, the baptism is open. We, the, you know, we, do, we baptize not just once, but several times at New Life, and some people are puzzled. But we've found two things about baptism. One is sometimes if you have sin in your life, it's like when you go to all the trouble to put you on these clothes and get up in there and say, I'm going to deal with this. It's like you leave the sin in the water and you come up clean. But not only that, we've found some commissioning. That is, that is, there's a call on people's life, and so they go in the water and they come back with the, the new hope of the commissioning. So if you, if, you want to, if you have this notion that you and God need to work something out in terms of what your calling is, come forward. If you really want to work it out, go see Michael and get in the water and say, God, this time I'm not making excuses. I'm going with you. In addition to that, uh, there'll be opportunity. Uh, uh, Bruce Roberts will be here if you don't know the Lord to be saved. And uh, Blake and Devin will be over here if you want prayer. And then I'll be hanging around here too if you want to just talk about mission possibilities or if you could uh, uh, just hang in there because we're going to get into the exact details of what New Life does, where it goes, and what you could be doing in the future. So everybody stand up. We'll have one more worship song, but please use this as an opportunity to say yes to God up front. You see, it's however you want to do it, but don't miss this chance. And then we'll be around for you to minister to you when we're done. Amen. shall come with trumpet sound, hold the island and him be found, trust in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand
altar is still open for anyone who would like to come forward. We also have people who will be here to pray for you if you need prayer today. And Michael is over at the baptistry if you would like to be baptized. We provide all of the clothes. You don't have to have anything um, to be baptized. We have everything for you. So if you would like to be baptized, Michael is here. And we also have communion that um, people can take you through if, if you'd like to. God bless you. May you have a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday and Wednesday night as well for House of Prayer. God bless you.